So good morning. Welcome. It's lovely to see you guys and uh, be able to share what's on my heart, what I do believe God has placed in my heart. And uh, yeah, I want to I wanna start. Last week we, we spoke about the, the story of Yafta and very much about an outcome-driven perspective that we sometimes live with. Uh, we, we always, uh, we, we try to focus on the, on the end of what we've, we ask from the Lord instead of, of journeying through the cross. Uh, and, and when we don't journey through the cross, we, don't, we, we sort of miss the, the, the lessons that God wants to teach us, but we also miss the, sort of the healing that can take place. Um, because when we are outcome-driven, it's always about the, the, I want to say, the disappointment is a lot bigger when that expectation or that outcome is not met. And it's also why I sort of started this morning and said, listen, just, just give your, your own heart and why you are here this morning. And, and hopefully through some of the word that is spoken this morning, you will you will see that there's always a journey through the cross. It's not around, it's not underneath, it's not over the top, but it's really through the cross. Because it's only through the cross that we receive true healing, that we receive a heart change, that we receive transformation. And um, yeah, we want to we trust that God will come um, and just transform our hearts continuously to a place of, of living in and simplifying our lives to really hear His heart, to experience Him more in our lives. And Yafta's, Yafta's story in, in, in the book of Judges is just one of many uh, of, of stories that we can relate to and, and often bargain with the Lord about certain things. But when that, when that, um, in walking through the cross, we discover the underlying issues that becomes visible in our lives. And let me give you an example. Let's say my wife and I, we are busy working on a project. So uh, we've been married, just to give you perspective, we've been married 15 years now. And uh, 15 years is a long time, so we, we should have things sorted. All right, so we work on a project, and the weeks leading up to the project, um, I receive some disappointing news. I receive some news that... that maybe disappoint me in the way that I've had an outcome or sought uh, or, or wanted to see a specific outcome, and it didn't, didn't work out like that. So I have this disappointing news, and in that same time, we start our project. So as we continue with the project, my wife comes in and she makes a remark of something that is not right. And in that very moment... In that very moment, everything breaks loose inside the little head of mine. And in Afrikaans, we call it the tor tlum af. You know, the tor just jumps off the wheel. It's like the bunny rabbit or what's it, uh, hamsters just fall off the wheel. Okay? And I, I go and lash out at her for these things that are happening. So in my explosion and reacting angrily and defensively because there's, there's this project and I can't see anything wrong with this project. Maybe it's not 100%, but the reason for that is she sees something. She wants to comment. She wants to maybe help make it right. But my first reaction is just this explosion, this angrily and defensive mechanism that I, place, that I put in place. All she receives is this badgering. So there, there's obviously a huge underlying issue that happens here. Will you agree with me on that? Um, and we can all agree that the situation needs attention. And this is much, uh, very much where the word allows us to see that all of us bear fruit in some, some way or, no, or another. It's either going to be good or bad. But often, it, 
the, the fruit exposes what is happening in the root, deep down. And the conclusion in this example of my reaction is the reaction was a bad fruit of a deeper, emotionally unhealthy root. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Roots and fruits. Fruits and roots. Same thing. Matthew 12, verse 33 to 37. Jesus speaks about bearing fruit. And he says in verse 33, he says, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account of every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. These are harsh words words from Jesus. And it wasn't to us. It was to the Pharisees that he spoke. And he calls them this brood of vipers. He calls them snakes. And he says, he illustrates anger with them. Because just before this, in the previous chapter of Matthew 12, uh, or the previous verses of Matthew 12, we discover or we see how Jesus tells them that it's actually it's, it's the sin or to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit is, is unforgivable in a sense. Okay. So he says that, um, and then he continues to, to, to root them out on the, on the evil. And he, say, he tells them, listen, your, uh, what, you, what, you exp- what you do here is, uh, is completely wrong. But I want to I look at the reaction of Jesus in this, in this part. And, and what was he feeling in his heart there? He was feeling anger. And immediately when we hear the word anger, and I demonstrate my example to you of, of an angrily response, you can e- instantly see there's a big difference between the two. So in a, in, a, in a sense, the word is, is not, or the word anger, or the feeling, anger is not wrong. It is what's in the heart. Because the word is clear that for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And if you are dealing with a disappointment, or you are dealing with something that's, that's happening in here, out of that place, out of that abundance, you will speak. And this was the case in my example, for instance. Out of the abundance of this disappointment, I acted defensively and I spoke out. I lashed out at my wife. And that was wrong. Jesus, on the other hand, lashes out on the Pharisees because he had a holy anger because of what they were doing. Because of wronging the kingdom of God. And I just want to illustrate, this is, this is a, a clear illustration of, of the indic, indication of a bad fruit that has an unhealthy root. And this is an important thing that you need to just not let go, but really deal with. And I'm, uh, hopefully I'm going to be able to give you some guidance as to, as to how to do it this morning. Because this is unfortunately not a process of a quick fix. It's not a plaster you uh, put on a wound and it will heal instantly or something like that's miraculous doing. This is a process. And you won't, you won't understand or you won't be able to, to get the proper healing if you don't deal with the root of the problem. So... Not dealing with the root and making it healthy again allowed the bad fruit to sprout forth from my mouth, as I said. But how do I deal with it? 
we have to deal with these roots. In, in a case, in my case, or in this example's case, it could be something that we've got to dig deep in. What, what could that be? It could be something like rejection. And all of a sudden, because there's another form of rejection of this wasn't right or that wasn't right, because of that rejection, previously, very long ago in my life, that I didn't deal with properly, that I didn't get proper healing from, that I didn't allow that root to properly heal, there's still a piece of that root that, that flows into the fruit, and, that, and it yielded a bad fruit. So there's many fruits that we can identify in our lives today, and I'm going to mention a few. And you can mentally make a note and say, hey, I, I, I know this one, or yes, I know that one. And then we're going to try and have a look at how do we deal with it. So roots identified can be things, uh, I think it comes from Ephesians Yes, Ephesians 4, verse 25 to 31. It speaks about falsehood, not, not speaking the truth. So there's a, there's a that place in your life where you, you sort of have two lives. Stealing. And here we don't just talk about the, the stealing of a car or something big. It's small, petty things. Stealing even just as, as much as stealing somebody's joy is a bad fruit. Corrupt talk. Taking from others and allowing them or, or, or you know, slandering them in the sense of talking down to them. Uh, trying to say that they are, you are better than they are. Bitterness, anger, wrath, glamour. Glamour, uh, glamour is, a, is a good one. It's complaining. It's called complaining in the English dictionary. Um, Slander, a false or malicious spoken statement. Malice, a desire to harm someone. And this is not just always physical. The problem with this is that these are just fruits. But the root is, is much, much deeper. So let's have a look at some of the roots that can... Can flow from that. So this is a bit of a, this is a picture that I got from LL Ministry. So it, it identifies some of the roots that we, that we have. Um, and they take it back way to the, to the, to your, to the time of conception in our lives that, that, could, that played a vital role. It's the manner and timing of conception in the mother's womb, the, mother's, the manner of birth, um, the lack of bonding, adoption, hereditary uh, factors in a family home signaling rejection, uh, the self-rejection caused by own attitudes, my own attitudes receiving and, and, and simply just not dealing with certain things, and multiple causes of puberty and beyond. But I want to I add a few, a few things here. Is, is, is one key thing of a, of a root that's not healthy is our identity in Christ. When you are not deeply rooted in, in who Christ is in your life, you will always and quickly be unsettled by, by changing circumstances. Then, uh, rejection. Rejection is a huge thing. It, it mentions it there. But rejection is a massive thing. Because the slightest little uh, comment or, or, or something said that you don't agree with is, is a form of rejection. And it immediately sparks a new uh, a fire, which is not a good fire. Unworthiness. People have been telling you your life that you are not good enough. What you do is not good enough. Maybe you are sitting here and because you don't have a job or you don't have enough money or you are not as rich as the person next to you, you feel unworthy. It's because we measure ourselves in the physical of what other people have. And we, we don't have our identity in Christ because we don't have we, we don't uh, because we don't have our identity in Him. It's it's difficult to to see things beyond the physical that we have. 
the family of origin. The Bible speaks in Exodus where, where God gives the commandments, the Ten Commandments. He speaks specifically about the third and the fourth generation that will continue to bear the sin of the fathers and the mothers. Very often we deal with these things because of our great-great-grandparents and the third and fourth generations back. We have the issues today. And those are changes that we need to deal with. Those are things. The way you will conceive trauma events. I never understood this. I never wondered, worried about it. But a big trauma event like somebody dying close to you, somebody being um, your, your, a, a divorce, your parents being divorced, an absent father and mother, uh, abusiveness in the home, those things are the things that causes roots to be unhealthy. Because it sparks something greater. And, and keep in mind, we are talking about this, simplifying our lifestyle to, to get a bigger picture or a, or a deeper understanding of who Christ is in our lives. We identify more with Him. And, and these are the things that, that hinders us from doing it. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So I'm reading a book by Peter Cesario, and he makes a valid point right in the beginning of the book, and he says the following, and we, we have it on there. He says, to feel is to be human, and to minimize or deny what we feel is a distortion of what it means to be, an, to be image bearers of God. To the degree that we are unable to express our emotions, we remain impaired in our ability to love God, others, and ourselves well. Why? Because our feelings are a, comp a component of what it means to be made in the image of God. And what he actually just says here is that it is okay to feel angry. It's okay to feel sad. It's okay to, to have a, to, to feel that your heart is broken. It's okay to deal. But we are so, in, 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 in the world today, we are taught very much as a Christian in the following way. And the next illustration, uh, one back. Or did I miss that picture? Uh, the enemy facts, the one with the facts on, uh, fact faith and feeling is it not there okay so imagine three blocks one two three and this is like a flow chart so we have a have a bit of a uh, we have a we have a flowing structure coming through it on the first block as a christian you are taught what scripture says is true. And you have to believe that. So very often when we have a feeling, when we have an uh, emotional thing that happens inside, we get to that point where we say, okay, but let's go back to the Word. The Word says, I don't have uh, that one scripture says, I do not have a, a spirit of... Um, we can speak about lust. We can speak about fear. I do not have a spirit of fear because I have a spirit of uh, I have one of power, of love, and of self-control. So I believe that, and that is what God says. Okay. Then we move on to the next part, and the next part says faith. So first we we identify the fact. We go back to the Word of God, and we say this is the fact. This is the thing that we we need to deal with. We 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 put the feeling aside. So we go to faith. We say what we what we've read just now is what we are going to believe. And then the last one in the line is feeling. When you get to the last part that says feeling, that's the part that we say we don't, we don't deal with these. Because if you don't, this is the one that's not to be trusted. Because Jeremiah 79, I believe, says that the heart is evil and full of deceit. Not to be trusted. But that's where the enemy really comes in and allows that root to, 
to rot uh, or rot. Okay. And because of the, the rot in that root, the fruit on top will also not be healthy, will not be optimal. So when I see fact, I say what, what God said in Scripture, I believe that. Faith says, do I choose to place my faith in the truth of God's Word? And the, fa- the feeling part is I do not trust it, but due to the sinfulness of the heart. But I want to say to you, that process is unbalanced. That process is a, is a process of oppressing um, feelings and not dealing with with the issue at hand. And very often we go to Scripture and we run to Scripture to give us verses that makes us feel good or makes us um, deny the, or walk around the issue at hand. And again, that sprouts forth bad fruit. And it yields bad fruit. And, and then we grow spiritually, but emotionally we remain immature. Because we don't know how to deal with these feelings. And all of a sudden, when they arise, when they are there, what happens? We get this outlash, and we don't understand why. And then there's this whole emotional whirlwind that plays a role in our, in our or that, that plays out in our lives in that situation, and we don't understand why. But here's a picture, um, and now we can go to the iceberg. This is what, what this illustration And what Peter says in his book illustrates. What the world see, what the people and other people see, is just above the red line, that tip of the iceberg. The tip of the iceberg we can always portray as a good one. I can I can I can allow my I can allow people to see what I want them to see. The problem comes on the bottom. And I want you to see. The difference in size. I want you to see that the background is far more complex than the top. What people see is a tiny bit, but what you experience and what you don't deal with is larger than life sometimes. If we don't deal with the root, the issues at hand that's deeper in our life, the fruit will not be optimal or will be bad. Let me end off with one last example. So I don't have green fingers. Okay? Whatever I plant either has to grow by itself or will die. I don't, it's, just, it's just one of those things. I can do whatever I think is right. I cannot get a, a plant to properly grow. So something is lacking on my part. Obviously, I need to acknowledge that. And then I need to deal with it. And two scenarios that arise from my inability to, to sort of grow plants, is that alone my trees will not yield fruit. And secondly, it might yield fruit, but it might not be optimal. I had somebody, we've, we've got this uh, kumquat tree in front of our house, and it's been there since we moved in three years ago, and that it has never, ever been without fruit. Never. Since the beginning. That we moved in. And it's sort of doubled in size now. Fruits have doubled. And I believe it's, it's, a, it's, it's really a blessing from the Lord. It's, it's con- a continuous reminder of what you, what you put in. But here's the thing. We didn't put in anything. We planted a few things on the bottom. Pl- par, uh, fat plants that uh, grow by themselves and do their own thing. And, um, but somebody came in the other day to pick up something. And they said, hey, listen. You need to cut half the branches of this thing. Prune them. And your fruit will be double the size that it is now. I'm like, how does it make sense? I cut half the tree down, it only half remains. 
But that's the thing. Alone, it won't yield the proper fruit it's supposed to be. So what do I need? I need the expertise of somebody else to advise me and that's when you either go to the nursery or you find somebody that has a luscious garden and you invite them to come and eat dinner with you and you make, set the table and you, and you lay out the question right at the end. You say, hey, you, I need help. But the same principle applies for our church family. The same principle applies for what we do in church. You see, we need one another to grow. Because alone, if I am by myself and I don't deal with the issues or the roots at hand that's unhealthy, I'm not going to yield fruit. Or I might not be optimal in the fruit tonight. So we need one another in the gifts, in the various gifts of the church, to edify one another, to dig a bit deeper, to make sure that we receive the correction, we receive the pruning part, so that our fruits can multiply or be optimal in the eyes of the Lord. How do we do that? Just one easy word. Are you ready for it? Drum roll. And the word is discipleship. Whew. That's an easy word. But why do we struggle to get it wrong? Why do we struggle to not engage in it? Why do we, why do we neglect that part of our lives to be taught by Jesus himself through others that has the gift? Or even my gift that I bring to the table? This week we shared a, a small video clip, short video clip of, of Potts and the clay maker. And I think it's right at the end that this clay maker says that, you know, the broken, the broken part of the pot or the broken pot needs to be put together with other broken parts so they can see that it's not about the perfect. You don't have to be perfect to be in the body of Christ. Guys, I have a lot of issues at hand. I deal with them in my, in my heart and in my quiet time, but alone, alone, I'm not going to be able to get my roots healthy. I need help. And the same with you. Jesus in John 15 verse 2 gives a cut to the heart statement. He says the following, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. The verse starts with saying that Jesus is divine. The vine. Not divine. He is divine, but he is the vine. And God is the vine dresser. And that he walks through this garden and he looks at the trees and he says, but hey, if you don't bear fruit, I'm going to cut you off. So bearing bad fruit and having no fruit, I think is very much in the same line. If you know that it's bad fruit and you don't deal with it. And on the other hand, if you have fruit, God's going to come and prune that branch. We as a branch, he's going to come and prune us. He's going to allow us to be to go through difficult situations so that we can learn from His Word. And in and through that, we yield more fruit. So if we bear fruit, we will be pruned for optimal growth as we abide in Him as the true vine. But today's message is not just about the fruits of our lives. It's not just about the fruit. Because I know that we all bear fruit, whether good or bad. And it shows in our lives. But the question is, how healthy are we 
on the inside, on the rooted part. So I've got three guidelines that I want to give you this morning to help you deal with this. And the first one is, we have to be rooted deeper to be stronger. The only way that we will grow as strong trees in the garden of the Lord is if we are rooted deeper. Simply saying that we are Christians and not living it through our relationship with Christ can easily uproot us. It's like maize in a field. You know that their roots are very shallow. It's only about this, this far, far in the ground. And it doesn't take a lot for that to fall over. But if you look at a thorn tree, and you try to uproot that, you're going to need to dig to China to get it out. Because a thorn tree might look small on the top, but it's double the size on the bottom. Rooted well. Constantly seeking for that river of life that provides growth. So, through our relationship with Christ, if we don't have that, we don't live it, we can easily be uprooted when the challenging wind comes into our life. The second thing is deep roots aren't always healthy roots. Go and make a list of things that, that you feel is exposed in your heart now after today's sermon. The fruits of the Spirit. See what you have in them, what you don't have. The question is, how and in what are you rooted? Are you rooted in the words of other people? Or are you rooted in the identity that Christ provided in you the moment that He took you as a son and a daughter and He adopted you in His, into His kingdom? It's time to look at the soil that we are rooted in. It's time to look at where you are planted. Are you planted in the things of the world? Is that a thing that you long for, that you are after constantly? Or are you rooted in Christ, in His family, in His church? And are you growing from that place? A few weeks ago, Mike said something profound. If you don't grow, the, uh, if you don't go, the church don't grow. If you don't come, the church don't grow. And it's not a manipulation or a guilty trick this trip this morning. I'm just saying, we have a responsibility because we are the body of Christ. And number three, we root downward to bear fruit upward. Isaiah 37 verse 31 says, And the surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. What do we see here? This is a beautiful promise from God to King Hezekiah when, uh, when the Assyrians oppressed Israel. And Hezekiah went to Isaiah and said to him, What must I do? And he said, Go and lay your heart before the Lord. And we see this beautiful prayer from King Hezekiah before the Lord because this is what, God, what, what Hezekiah did um, as, a, as a difference to what the Assyrians did. The king of Assyria went to his own gods, but King Hezekiah went to the house of the Lord. When he went to the house of the Lord and he, he laid down his heart before the Lord, when, when that, that, that unhealthy root could be cleaned, that oppression could be taken away. This was one of the promises of the Lord. And he gave them, from the first year you will eat of that what you've planted. In the second year you will be able to, to, uh, um, to, to replant from the, from the first produce. In the third year you'll be able to fill up the storehouses. Paraphrasing a lot. 
But that's what he says. Isn't that what our hearts should long for? That when we root downward, we bear fruit upward. We have to dig deeper into God's Word. We have to dig deeper into our relationship with Christ. You see, taking root downward is not easy. Because all the obstacles of life lie down there. The rocks, the worms, the bad things that wants to to uproot us. They lie downward. But if you don't go down, you won't grow up. It's not quick. It's not glamorous. It will require honesty. It will require willingness. But the reward of growing downward is that the fruit upward will be God's will be God's intended fruit for your life. Because our focus is not there. Our focus is growing down, growing deeper. Are you with me? I want us to divide into groups of two. And I want you to pray with somebody this morning the following prayer. And it says, God, when I consider today's message, the only thing I can say is, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. We have to agree that we, with all the, all the fruits that we sometimes yield, we, we are born as sinners. Thank you that I stand before you in the righteousness of Jesus, in his perfect re- record, and performance are not my own. We have to understand that it's not about us, but it's about Him. Let's root ourselves in His identity. I ask that you would not simply heal the symptoms of what is not right in my life. We don't want to just spray a bit of Auntie Nora's um, healing potion on the, on the plants and let the lice fall off and deal with the root at hand here. And that's why we say not just the symptoms of what is right in my life, but that you would surgically remove all that is in me that does not belong to you. As I think about my life and actions, Lord, pour light over the things that are hidden. Maybe there's something that you need to just lay before the Lord this morning. May I see clearly as you hold me tenderly. Guys, that's something that Jesus continuously do. He holds you 